Hey everyone, before we get into today's show, I have something so exciting to share with all of you. And that is that I am starting work on my next book, which is going to explore something that is a little bit terrifying and something that makes me very uncomfortable, and that is vulnerability. And the reason why this terrifies me and makes me uncomfortable is because I am not a vulnerable person. I'm specifically going to be looking at vulnerability and leadership, but here is the best part. I want to include you in the book. I am looking for stories, insights, and experiences from all of you leaders out there who have been vulnerable at work, whether that ended up helping or hurting you. If you want to be featured in my upcoming book and a soon-to-be-released podcast exploring vulnerability and leadership, then please take a few minutes to answer some questions that you can find at the vulnerableleadersurvey.com. Again, that's the vulnerableleadersurvey.com. I will be sharing much more on this in the coming weeks and months, but for now, I'm looking forward to reading what you have to say about vulnerability and leadership. This episode is brought to you by Namely. With workforces continuing to evolve, it's more important than ever to keep in pace with the nature of business but it can be even harder to stay ahead and keep employees connected and engaged. That's why you should check out Namely, the all-in-one HR solution that offers everything you need to set you up for success in the new year so that you can tackle any curveballs that 2022 throws your way. Namely helps you easily adapt to the ever-changing workplace and maintain a great employee experience whether you have 50 or 1,000 employees. With onboarding, performance management, and intuitive benefits enrollment, all in one connected and modern platform. Plus, Namely can streamline your payroll, time tracking, and vacation requests so that you can be everyone's favorite HR leader no matter how your company grows. Companies are built on people. Don't let either fail. Stay ahead and learn more by making the switch to Namely. Learn more about making the switch to Namely today at namely.com. Don't wait, that's namely, N-A-M-E-L-Y dot com. Great leaders around the world and, and history, and they're all different. You know, some people say, oh, you gotta be really charismatic. And some say, no, 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 be very humble. And you know, but it's all different. And I'm not sure, and I'm not sure anybody does know really what the secret is. And look, in all the stuff you've done, also, I'm sure you have seen lots of different styles and different ways, but it works. And other things, they don't work and it's the same style. So I'm not sure, but what I've tried to do is take the best from what I saw. You know, I've now been in business. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Future of Work. My guest today is Glenn Fogel. He is the president and CEO of Booking Holdings. Glenn, thank you for joining me. Well, thanks for so much for having me. So people might recognize uh, Glenn from The Future Leader book. He was one of the CEOs who was featured in there. And I've been trying to get Glenn on this podcast for a while now. And finally, we were able to make it work. So uh, Glenn, I'm really, really looking forward to speaking with you. I'm really happy to be part of it. Why don't we get started first with a little bit of background information about you. Uh, you, you can take us way back. Uh, how, how did you grow up? Where were you raised? And how did your life turn into you becoming the CEO of Booking Holdings? Well, I, I think it's like most people's lives, completely chaotic, not planned. You know, people say, hey, did you always want to be in travel, like from the womb? And I'm like, no. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, 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 I grew up in a, a nice town outside New York City and um, you know, public schools and uh, first generation go to college, did that. And I came out and I started in the IT world. I was actually a programmer. This is back in the uh, 80s and wow. stuff. And I wasn't very good at it. And uh, I realized that I got to do something else. And I was at a big bank and, and the banker people were making like loads of money. And I'm like, I want to do what they're doing. But you can't do that just from being an IT jockey to go be an investment banker. You gotta get like a graduate degree. So I went off, I went to law school, got that, uh, came out, went as a uh, person in investment banking. And the people I was working, the companies I was working on were airlines, air transportation, and uh, real exciting and worked on it for a number of years. And then it augured in, it, it, it basically got sold and everybody got fired. 
which is really, really, really hard. And and I didn't do much for a couple of years, actually. I tried, I wrote a book, not like you. So you wrote a book and it was successful. I wrote a book and nobody wanted to touch it. But I met a woman and uh, we got serious and she said, you know, Glenn, you know, for this to go forward, you should get a job. <laughs> so I got a job as a trader, a trader at a big investment bank. And uh, I didn't like that so much either. Uh, but it was, um, it was the time where the internet was just beginning to really take off, yeah. 1999. And you know, I said, yeah, I want to try to do that. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's kind of like how it happened. I, I left banking, went into a, went to this company, a little company called Priceline.com. And I've been there 22 years since. Wow. That's crazy. 22 years. And uh, for people who are not familiar with booking holdings, you obviously own uh, several brands, Priceline being one of them. Uh, yep. Can you give people a little bit of information about the company, the brands? Uh, how many employees do you guys have and what do you guys do? Yeah, so we have a little more than 20,000 right now. And unfortunately, it, we had to let go about a quarter of our of our workforce during the pandemic. Travel, of course, terribly, terribly impacted by um, you know, this virus. This pandemic has been horrific and, and, and travel is very uh, probably hardest hit probably. Um, restaurants, too, of course. Um, we own, of course, Priceline.com because I started at Priceline and later on we changed the name to be Booking Holdings because our biggest company is called Booking.com. Some people in the States don't know that as well. It's uh, started out in Amsterdam in Europe, but we also own companies like Open Table with, you know, restaurant reservations. And we own a company called Kayak that's a meta search for travel. And we own a company uh, called Agoda, which does travel. It's out in Asia. Lots of companies. Uh, it's all the oriented towards hospitality, whether it be travel or restaurants that are trying to make people's lives better. So you mentioned during COVID you had to let go of a quarter of your workforce. Uh, there have been a lot of stories in the news of how leaders have let go of their people, some with with grace and, and being human and others getting on a Zoom call and just saying, hey, 900 of you guys are fired. Can you talk about when you know you need to make a tough decision like that, like letting go of, of such a large percentage of your workforce, how do you do it in a way that's human uh, and, and doesn't you know, discount the fact that, that people have obviously lives and families. Like how, how do you, because a lot of leaders struggle with this, right? And it's just, and it's not just hiring or firing, it's difficult conversations. How do you, how do you make these things human? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's not a human thing to do. Yeah. It's an inhuman thing to tell somebody, hi, thank you for playing. You can now leave. Yeah. It's really, really hard. And if you say it the way I just said it, that'd be really cruel. And I've talked, and you and I talked, I think we talked, maybe we did, maybe we didn't. Last time we spoke about when I was, when my, the company I'd been at, uh, you know, everybody was let go, we got bought by another company, and then they said goodbye, everybody. And that's really, really hard. But no matter how you say it, it's not going to be good. It's not going to be easy. No one's going to thank you for doing it. Uh, some people may be less angry and less hurt if you do it nicer. And if you give people really good severance packages, that's really helpful and you help people get new jobs that's helpful but it's no matter how you can do it it's going to be it's going to be a hard conversation a hard thing to do especially when you're trying to do a large group at once because you can't go to everybody individually because by the time you're done with maybe number three the other two thousand people are going to already know from all the social chat that's going to go on so you really you do come out with an initial to everybody and that seems incredibly cold but otherwise, you're going to do it one, two, two, six. That's not going to work either. Yeah, it's really hard no matter how you do it. There is no giant, you know. Here's how you, you know, uh, uh, plan or this is how you do it. You try and do it as best you can. You try and compensate. You try and do it. And, and fortunately, now, unlike when we, you know, we had to do it um, in the court of our staff, you know, economies were still tough. It was still hard. Now, when you make changes, at least we know for many parts of the world, particularly in the U.S. The job market is so hard. Somebody, you know, loses a job today. You, you want a new job? Just ask. You just put, raise your hand because there are lots of places that are hiring. Yeah, you know, that's very true. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, how did you learn to become a leader? Did, did you go through formal leadership training when you were younger? Uh, did you just learn on the job through experience? Yeah, um, I'm not sure I've really learned yet. You know, I'm <laughs> like, it'd be nice. Again, wouldn't it be wonderful if there are courses that said, okay, here's how you become a leader. Yeah, but the thing is, if you look at great leaders around the world and, and history, and they're all different, you know, some people say, "Oh, you got to be really charismatic," and some say, "No, no, no, be very humble," and you know, it's all different. 
and I'm not sure, and I'm not sure anybody does know really what the secret is. And look, in all the stuff you've done, also I'm sure you have a lot, seen lots of different styles and different ways, but it works. And other things, they don't work in the same style. So I'm not sure, but what I've tried to do is take the best from what I saw. You know, I've now been in business, boy, this is right. My God, I can't believe this is long. It's almost 35 years, I guess, yeah. no more. Yeah, it's a, it's and and you just try and take the best pieces you saw. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna replicate that because I that that felt real to me. I'm gonna do use that thing. So so it sounds like you basically had to learn as you went, learn through experience. Yeah, I guess that's the way to say it. Yeah, yeah. And, and still, you know, you learn from yourself too because yeah, you do stuff and then afterwards you realize, oh, that wasn't good. Don't do that one again. That did not work out so well at all. And try and like, where did I go wrong? Oh, that's where. Uh, Boy, I wish I could do that again. Do you have any uh, stories or experiences that come to mind throughout your career of when you've worked for a leader and you thought, okay, I really like that. I should emulate that. And one where you're like, oh, that's terrible. I'm never going to do that as a leader. It's funny. The the bad things stick with you more than yeah. the good things. The ones that <laughs> stick in your mind. Like, really? People love the bad stories. Yeah. Like, so the, um, you know, this, uh, when you get... You mentioned firing and stuff like that. So the episode when I was let go, it was a mass firing type thing. It was at a bank. And the way it worked was uh, you're working and all of a sudden somebody says, hey, you have to go to this meeting. And, and you go to the meeting and you kind of now kind of know what's kind of going on because it's already happened to some people earlier. So, oh, no. And you go in and there's a person there and there's a HR person there and they have a script and they read off the script. And then you ask a question or something, and they go back to the script. And then you say another thing, and they realize, okay, this is not going to be a conversation. This is like... Wait, so this, so this actually something. happened to you when you got let go? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not making this up. This so is they, how it goes. They yeah. read a script to you? Yeah, they got a script. They got it written out. They got it written out. Exactly. Yeah. This is like... Wow. And that they don't deviate from it. Here's what your, here's what your severance is. Here's, you know, all things. And then at the end, and this is the really part that's interesting... You have until uh, you have until today to um, to get off uh, you know the floor basically. You get your stuff and and everything is shut down and and you know you're you're gone that day. That's it's like no goodbye, no nothing. That's it. It's okay, let's not do that. Never do that. Never ever ever do that. So I can't imagine. The, the, the we, yeah, sorry? I can't imagine walking into a room and somebody's literally sitting there with a piece of paper and saying, well, two people. Go. What two was people. it? It's always two because it's the person. And the HR person. Yeah. And so they literally say, Glenn, sit down. And then they take out a piece of paper and then they literally just read you the paper. The paper was already on the desk. That's nuts. <laughs> that was already there. I can't, I, I can't imagine that happening today. I mean, that, that would be, um, it's funny. I, I think that's how it used to be for a lot of companies, but I don't, you don't really hear much of that today. Do you? No, they, they, they say it, they say it, they say it by zoom. It's different. <laughs> So I think you heard the story that I'm that I'm referring to, right? Um, remind me. It was the CEO of um uh oh man, what was the home builder? Uh or not a home builder, it was a credit uh, credit company. Um that's slipping my mind, but he basically fired 900 people over uh over Zoom. Oh yes. Yeah, so a bunch of people joined this Zoom meeting. And then uh he's like, you know what? You guys, uh, if you're on this meeting, you're you're being let go. Yeah. And uh, which is, you know, crazy to me. Um, well, it is, but yeah, again, but here's the thing is, so again, it's, it's, these things are very, very different. Better because, com. That's the, that's the company better.com. Right. right. But the question is, how do you, I mean, yeah, I got the initial discuss, you know, initially, hi, we have a change happening and I'm sorry, but you know, many of you were, we're not going to be able to retain you and such. And I mean, but, and then, Please, you'll have a meeting with your manager and HR. We'll figure out. And here's all. What I mean, the words matter a great deal. Yeah. But what if everybody's on Zoom? What do you get? How it's not like you can get them all into a meeting. So yeah, I don't know what the right thing to do in that is. But I do remember the I remember reading, and still it's going to continue to happen. Everything. This is the the part that's interesting is that everything changes. Businesses change. 
the world changes and we need to make changes and sometimes these changes are really really painful they hurt people i understand that and you try and do it in a way that it'll hurt less okay but nothing you're going to do or say is really going to do yes you, know, you can make it worse but you can't make it all better because you're already made the corporate decision that what's right what's best for the entity going forward is this and part of the thing is most people don't like change yeah. it's hard they don't like it they want everything to stay the same but it's not the way the world works unfortunately yeah i think the last few years have certainly taught us that um yeah any other uh, bad stories like that that come to mind as far as something you've experienced and you thought well I yeah i mean that. yelling at people i mean that's another one you know you read about people who yell and like why do you think they don't hear you? I mean, why why the yelling part? I mean, I had a couple screamers and about I've had bosses who are screamers. And I, and I, you know, one thing is you can react really negatively. Uh, somebody yells and screams at you, you scream back maybe, but if it's your boss, maybe you don't because you don't want to scream and get fired. So then you scream at your spouse or your partner or your kids instead later because you're really angry. But I never understood the idea of screaming at people to what? They're going to work harder if you yeah. scream at them? Probably not going to be very effective. But so yeah. that's another one where I, I think of some bosses I've had who are just, I just didn't get it. And, and I think Jack Walsh was famous for that, wasn't he? Maybe. I don't know. I, I, I can't say. I can't, I can't say possibly. Yeah, I, I remember I just, some, stories, some stories from people who worked at GE of Jack uh, yelling and uh, maybe throwing a chair or something like that. I only had one business meeting with him of any substance ever. And at the one, he didn't yell or scream. But he, he did, he did um, poke holes in a very pointed, let's say pointed way, pointed mm -hmm. way at you, and uh, made you feel small. Yeah. But, you know, he's trying to get, you know, is this worth spending this money or not and whatever. But I, I, I won't forget it. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, what about some uh, good experiences? So some leaders that you've worked with or for where you thought, you know what, that's, uh, that's a great way to lead. I'm, I'm going to try to do that. Yeah, there, there are a couple. I mean, uh, uh, Jeff Boyd, my former CEO of the company I, now, he was he was just fantastic in being calm, thinking things through, coming up with the right decision, not feeling how to dominate the room. But you knew that when he spoke, he was to listen. Ah. And that was that was a, a good trait to, to learn. Yeah, no, the calmness is, is great. Um... How do you prepare? And this is something that a lot of leaders, I think, struggle with. <clears throat> Obviously, COVID came about, uh, disrupted a lot of things. How do you prepare or think about scenarios like this that are unpredictable? Uh, like, can you strategize or plan or prepare for this stuff? Or what? I mean, you're leading a 20,000 person company. <laughs> How do you think about these things that can disrupt your business so much? Well, so one of the things that our company has and many companies have is a risk committee. And their job is thinking about all the things that can go wrong. <laughs> so they do. And it's not hard because you can you can just basically sit down. And you can think of all the not all, but you can think of a lot of things that can go wrong. In fact, we in our documents that we file with the SEC, risk factors, we had in them pandemic. It was there, been there for a long time. Because you had that in there? Oh yeah, because we went through travel during the first SARS bit back in 2003 or whenever that was, 2004, and that kind of shut down Asia travel. So we knew, oh, this is a bad thing, this could happen. So if you look at the risk factors, pandemic listed right there, you know, right right off a whole bunch of others. But here's the thing is, what do you do about it? Yeah. So you list it, you know you put it in there, so you know now the investors can't sue you because you made them, you, you gave them warning that, hey guys, you know, you buy stock in this company, if a pandemic were to happen, it's probably not gonna be good for the business. So you're, you're on warning, if you buy the stock, you gotta be aware that's a risk. And that's why, the, that's why risk factors are there. And now everybody knows, and nobody's gonna think that you fooled them or anything like that, that's a risk. But what do you do about that risk? Hmm. Because what's the percentage chance it's going to happen or not? Yeah. And how much money are you going to spend to prepare for something that may not happen? And there's no way to insure that. No insurance company is going to give you a pandemic insurance that says, hi, if our business goes to zero, could you kind of replace it for a few months or something? So that's, that's a really tricky thing. And by the way, you have outside investors who are looking at your performance and they're looking at your profits and they're saying, where are you spending the money? 
They may not want you to spend that money right now. They may say, no, no, we'll take the risk on that pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the thing I once read about, it was really interesting, was about 9-11. And it talks about that there were people who said, because there had been an incident in France, there had been a couple of things before 9-11, where somebody had come into the cockpit and threatened wow. or done some things or not. And of course, there had been a lot of air piracy, hijacking stuff. And there were people who said, you know, should armor the cockpit doors with CCTV so nobody can get in unless you see who the person is and you let them in if you want to, if you're the pilot or not, like a flight attendant who's going to give you dinner or a crazy terrorist with a gun you don't let in. And people thought about it a lot, but then, you know, airlines say, well, how much would that cost? Armored, armored doors? I don't know, that's a little expensive. Uh, what's the chance and all that? And if they had done it, and then, of course, 9-11 may not have happened at all and mm -hmm. stuff like that. We would have thought, great. But beforehand, you know, you're looking at your costs. Should I spend that money or not? And that's a decision leaders have to make all the time. And I say this all the time about risk. Look, I don't know, in the U.S., maybe, um, uh, hopefully that people won't laugh at me for getting the number wrong, but I think about 40,000, maybe 50, somewhere around there, 1,000 people die a year on our highways in car accidents. Yeah. Yeah. If everybody drove a tank instead of a car, There'd be no deaths because tanks don't go very fast. They're very, very big and lots of armor and they just collide. You know, you don't have the gun work, of course, but, but you know, they, they collide. Not much is going to have. It's going to be like bumper cars, but they're really bad on the roads. The treads, they rip up the roads a lot. And I hear they're really bad on gas mileage and there are no electric vehicle tanks yet. So for society, we said, you know, that's not a good idea. And we are willing to accept. 40,000, 50,000 deaths. That's, and, uh, you know, we try and make it safer and safer each year and all that. It's a balance. We make decisions on how much risk are we willing to accept, whether it be a company or society. That's mm -hmm. how we go. How do you balance uh, the short term with the long term? Because obviously, uh, as the CEO of a company, as the, the leader there, you want to make sure your organization is successful in the short term. You're achieving your goals, you're making your shareholders and stakeholders happy. But at the same time, you also want to make sure the organization is going to be around for 5, 10, 15, 20 sure. years. Are those things sometimes at odds with each other or how do you how do you make both happen? Well, there's definitely there's always tension between that. Always tension. For and especially if you have stakeholders with different time horizons. You have somebody who wants a return right now and you have somebody who's willing to be a long-term holder. And there are other stakeholders, community, <laughs> workers. Yeah. There's lots of stakeholders to deal with. You're balancing all of them, trying to come up with what is the right balance so that in the long run, is my view, is where you should orient. You have to look down the road, not for this quarter or next quarter or this year. you got to be thinking about the future because if you don't do that and invest for the future, then eventually the you know it's all going to be gone. And we know many companies that did not look for the long term, went for the short term, and eventually they disappeared. Hmm. That is a, a, a certainty. So you try to do it. But again, if you're always talking about, oh, it's all going to happen down the road, well, eventually people will say, well, this down the road never seems to come. So you've got to also have short term results to prove to make people believe that what you're doing for the long run is going to happen, or at least have some belief that it could happen, because you're at least you're achieving short term goals that they were so you set a little while ago, or, you know, and seeing the long terms that you said, hitting them over and over, I say, this is what we're going to do. And we're gonna get there. And then three years later, we're there, they will trust that I have another thing out that says another three years, we're gonna get somewhere else. But I do, I do worry about and, and lots of people talk about this, this short terminism, yes, that people talk about where people are so oriented to the near term, making the quarter, making the year. And then, of course, you know, you're, you're nowhere in, uh, you know, three years, five years. Yeah, that's a tough thing. I mean, how do you get over that? Because I'm sure you I mean, you're uh, uh, you have a lot of people who are invested in the company and they're probably pressuring you quite a bit, like deliver every quarter. How do you uh, how do you make that balance? How do you communicate that to, to people? Well, and, and certainly there are some who are like that. There are others who are very willing if you tell them and you explain what the plan is and you show proof points why this plan is a good plan and then as you're executing the plan you have milestones along the way that you can show them aha we're on course we're on target we're look what we just accomplished here here and here that's a really good way to develop that kind of trust and that people will be willing to accept perhaps a less rosy short-term result 
recognizing uh, that the probability of a long-term success is higher. This episode is brought to you by Namely. With the workforces continuing to evolve, it's more important than ever to keep in pace with the nature of business. But it can be even harder to stay ahead and keep employees connected and engaged. That's why you should check out Namely, the all-in-one HR solution that offers everything you need to tackle any curveballs that 2022 throws your way. Whether you have 50 or 1,000 employees, Namely helps you easily adapt to the ever-changing workplace. With onboarding, performance management, payroll, and intuitive benefits enrollment all in one connected modern platform. Companies are built on people. Stay ahead of business trends and don't let either fail. Learn more about making the switch to Namely today at Namely.com. Don't wait. That's Namely, N-A-M-E-L-Y.com. How do you set goals? Uh, and I guess we can look at this from two sides, from uh, you know personal goals for yourself and also goals for the business. Do you have a process that you go through? Do you work with a coach? Do you you know are these things you write down? Well, let's talk. Let's talk uh, for the company. And the company, the goals are set in many different ways, and it all boils together. So you're throwing everything into the pot and spinning it around and all that, because we have it coming from bottom up, from the people who are really troops on the ground who know things really well, what they think is going to be happening. This, you have stuff that's coming top down where things that we think are going to be really good for the long term and such. So what's it going to take? What's it going to cost to achieve those things? What do you think, when do we think the results are going to be? And then we're talking to our board directors about make sure they feel comfortable with what we're coming up with. And you're iterating, iterating again. And that's how that's how it comes out. That's how the goals come out. Personally, it's uh, I, 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 I am the person on the ground and I'm also the board of directors. So I do have I do have a spouse who also helps 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 me with that setting what are our goals. And it's uh, it's a little bit different. But again, balancing the short term and the long term also important all the time. Yeah, that's no, not easy to do. Uh, has vulnerability ever played a role in your leadership style? I am what I am, and I don't know if people see me as a vulnerable person or not a vulnerable person. I don't, I don't know. I am what I am, and I think it's important not to put on a false good front. That's the way to talk about it, and, and I think it's helpful to people sometimes if you tell them the truth that I don't know. I think yeah. I think people appreciate I don't know better than a, it's definitely going to be this way, even though in your heart of hearts, I don't know about this one. So I think that's good. Other times, though, other times, though, it's, 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 it, I think I'll say the pandemic is a good example of this, okay? I really knew, I believed, heart of hearts, I believed that this would take uh, a couple of years. And I said it very loudly, publicly, very early. And I said in my earnings calls and investors, anybody I said, look, this is not going to be quarters. This is going to be years to recover. And it's now two years. But I also said, but I, I, I can't say what the impact's going to be on our journey to come out and you know to say look it could be really horrible for a lot of people yeah. and that's the truth i you know i was gonna go say oh no it's all gonna be fine don't worry because <laughs> that's not the way i believed it was gonna be yeah well i like the message of i am what i am <clears throat> so in other words who you are at work and who you are at home you don't have like a different persona a, di a different glenn who comes home and a different glenn who shows up to work each day well, I haven't been to the office in two years, so I'm kind of the same guy because it's all in the home. So, so it's, this is the home office. This is where I am. I have not yet traveled to, to the office. So I am where I am, and home and office are the same physically. Um, you know, there is a little difference because I, I think my family would say you're a bit sillier, yeah, yeah. Bit mature, more mature when you're, you know, without being with business people. And I, I certainly dress differently. This is my formal attire for work. That's crazy. I can't. So you haven't been to an office in two years? I have not been to the office in two years. And part of it is each time I step ready, it's almost like my jinx because I start thinking I'm going to go. And then a new variant comes in and makes it all bad again. So um, that's that's been the problem. Or Or the risk that if you go, if I go overseas, the risk, and this just happened to somebody uh, we had who went overseas, is if you test positive, even if you're not feeling ill, you can't get home in the States because yeah. they won't let you come back until you have a negative test. And that person had to spend an extra 10 days abroad and couldn't go back to his family 
because of this rule, which is, of course, absurd. Just, just let's cut it straight. That's absurd. I mean, the idea that there's somebody who thinks that if we keep people out who are testing positive, that, that'll, we won't have right now, as of, uh, as of yesterday, I think 2,500 deaths a day. And the infection rate would be different if we continue to keep people out who test positive. Yeah. I mean, is that nuts? And now you say, I don't want somebody to test positive on a plane. Okay, that makes sense. I got that part. But if you've been, you know, whatever, eight days or whatever since you, you know, and you don't feel, you know, no symptoms at all. I mean, the PCR test is so sensitive that it can test positive for a really long time after you're not infectious anymore. So yeah, I think I've people really stories need stories around that uh, with friends and family members who've been stuck in different places. It's, yeah, it's uh, not easy. They've got to come up with a better way of key people who are yeah. infectious off the plane. I'm not sure if just testing positive is the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, a, a time when you had to face a, a challenge or adversity. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read or heard something about uh, in high school you had a, a stroke. Was that right? That is absolutely correct. 17. Can, can Left you, hemisphere. Can you share the story and, and what happened and how you recovered? Yeah, I, I, I woke up one morning, uh, 17. It was uh, springtime, early May, I think, and um, felt kind of funny. wasn't exactly right and started bumping into the walls because uh, left uh, hemisphere, right body. So I started drooping, not coordinated face. Parents saw me and they're like, oh, this isn't good. Hospital got worse um, and uh, lost all language abilities. Um, couldn't speak, uh, couldn't read, I was couldn't write. I I would hear people, and I kind of they spoke slowly, I kind of understood what was being said, which is real interesting about the way the brain works, where different parts, some parts work okay, some parts don't work at all. And um, I was I was able to walk out of the hospital under my own steam, even though I had right side, right side paralysis right at the beginning, it went away relatively rapidly. Mm-hmm. And, and my physical being able to move, Pretty quickly, I got physically okay, but the but the reading part and um, the speaking part much slower to get back, and but it did, and there's no magic to it, really. The the brain is incredibly plastic. Plasticity is so something that a lot of people didn't think about the brain. They thought, well, if something dies, it's done. But actually, yeah, the, that part of the brain is done, but other parts really develop new ways of doing things and all that. It's really, it's, it's fascinating science about this. And um, my my mother would talk to my wife and say, oh, he used to be so smart when, before you met him, you know, when he was 17 and stuff. I have no idea <laughs> if I was smarter when I was 17 or not. I don't know. But I, you know, I, I, I know that I can speak fairly well. I can read fine. I can write fine. Um, I did graduate with honors for Harvard Law School, so I, I'm not an idiot. I kind of, it came back a good, well enough. But, um, you know, it's something that happens and no reason. Who knows why? My, you know, the blood just didn't get to the parts of the brain that needed to be there. And that part just didn't work out so well. I can imagine that was probably a pretty terrifying experience that was happening to you, right? Not to me. I'm sure my parents and family, I'm sure they were all, I, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't, even, even when I was in the hospital, I was frustrated, frustrated. I could, you know, feel for, but I wasn't afraid. It wasn't, it wasn't terror. It wasn't fear. It was frustration. And then as I got home and stuff and couldn't, uh, I remember I also wanted to call somebody and I knew like, okay, telephone book, that's where the telephone numbers are. I knew that. Open it up, but I really, it looked like looking at Egyptian hieroglyphics. Wow. <laughs> like, how am I, I going to do this? <laughs> Jeez. That's crazy to imagine that. But I mean, somehow you you got through, you recovered. I mean, that seems to me at least like a, a, a very big challenge or an obstacle to overcome. Uh, do any other challenges or obstacles come to mind, either personal or professional, that, um, that you had to overcome? Yeah, we all, we all have obstacles every day. Yeah. Every day. We all have them, some big, some small. Nobody gets out of this life easy. I mean, it's hard stuff all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's unfortunate, but we don't get a guarantee for uh, good times all the time throughout, you know, your however many years it is. Mm-hmm. And each of us has, and I've had a bunch, but 
I don't want to make mine any different than everybody else's. We all got it. And it's all bad and it's tough. And we get over it, most of us. Sometimes we don't. Some people, they have, you know, it just doesn't work out so well. Many of us, we have them, we go over it. And some of us, it gets us stronger. It, you, you find it better. Huh? And for myself, certainly, um, my first semester in uh, at university, in college, uh, which is the first time I was really back, really at school, because I you know, as a junior when I had the stroke, and then all the way around, I was able to go because uh, I had enough credits. I graduated. I only took two classes in uh, high school as a senior, and uh, two credits you have to do to get the diploma. But I could have, I could have gotten D's, and we would have been fine. So, and um, I remember though, I I really want to work extremely hard because I wanted to prove I like, you know I'm back, I'm good, and so I was very very disciplined about working hard, and that's something that has carried me forever is a sense of discipline. That's how. That's how I work. Other people maybe not, you know, they do different things, but that's a way to help get over something is to work hard at that problem. It's actually interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the, the discipline and the hard work piece, because, you know, there's a lot of conversation around what makes a great leader. And, and we talk a lot about, uh, you know, and I've written about skills and mindsets, and there's a lot of studies out there. But it seems like competence and discipline and hard work is something that we don't hear enough about. Because it's still an important and critical factor to be successful, whether you're a leader or an individual contributor. Um, it's not just about emotional intelligence. It's not just about being human. It's you still need to be good at your craft. You still need to be good at your job. So when you say discipline, uh, what, what does that look like for you? Um, what, what does discipline mean? What does hard work mean? Is it just about putting in like 100 hours a week? That helps. Well, but center, what's better is that the 100 hours are spent well. Mm that you know what's important to spend the time on and what you don't spend time on. Yeah. I'm amazed by people who tell me that they're overwhelmed, but I'm certain that if I looked at the amount of time they spent on social media, they'd find, well, actually they had a lot of time actually. Yeah. And you, they, but they would may say, well, but I need that. That's my enjoyment. My, and I'm saying, well, I agree. You should have time to have enjoyment, but was that really enjoyment or maybe, you know, that wasn't, you could have done something else with it. And, I think that a lot of a lot of people sometimes I only know from a small selection of people I know, but I see people who aren't as disciplined about how they use their time. And if you really want to use it for social media, let's say use that example, that's okay as long as you consciously made that decision, that's how I'm going to spend the time. No. Not it just sort of happened, you got locked and you just done scroll and looking and that's that's not a good thing. Yeah, social media could be an endless black hole. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you spend your day. So how do you how do you structure your time? So, you know, what time are you up in the morning? Uh, what does your routine look like? And all the way through uh, when you go to bed at night? So I used to I used to always wake up at five. Okay. And for some reason, over the last year, it's been slipping to six. Uh -oh. and it, could, it could be because it could be because I don't need the time to commute to the office. So, so that could be part of the reason. But I'm still going downstairs to my basement and still working out every morning. So that that's religion. I, so that's my religion. I'm I'm praying in the basement. The, my 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 exercises, and I'm doing that. And then come up, fire up the you know computer, and get on all the things that need to get done. And it's busy. Go throughout the whole thing. End the day with uh, dinner with my, my wife and when the kids were home, I, I have them, they're both at university age now, so they're they're there right now, but in the summer they're together and such, and uh, have dinner. And then many times back to work, and it could go to like 10 o'clock or so, but if not, then it'd be with my wife, do something, a uh, movie, something like that, try and get to sleep by 11, Definitely by 12, I like to get at least six hours. I really do. doesn't always happen, but I do like that. And uh, then wake up, do it again. And that's the method. Do you think that leaders, the higher you become in a company, uh, you know, ultimately becoming CEO, the harder you have to work, um, you know, the more hours you have to put in, the more responsibility you have, the more accountability, you know, the more is on your shoulders and therefore the more you need to do? So sometimes I'm working really, really hard and some Friends will say, well, I don't get it. Why do you work so hard? The president doesn't seem to work so hard, and he's got a bigger job than you have. Yeah. So maybe yeah, what you're do you not doing it. Right. <laughs> but 
But in answer to your question, I've always worked incredibly hard. And that comes back, I think, at school that I, I know I'm not the smartest guy for sure, because I've met a heck of a lot of people a lot smarter than I am. And I'm, I'm, you know, all sorts of things I'm not good at. The one thing I know I'm good at is I got a lot of drive. I got a lot of endurance and I got discipline yeah. and I may not be able to go faster than a lot of people, but I can go longer and I can try harder and I and that could be right and wrong it could be foolish maybe not working so hard and things would have been better and all that I don't know I just know the method that I, I've found effective for me for yeah. other people maybe entirely different yeah and I think that's important because people need to find out what what works for them uh, can you share any um, mistakes that come to mind or failures uh, you know things that you've done during your career that I don't know did you spend a lot of money on an acquisition that failed? Did you fire somebody who shouldn't have been fired? Any, any mistakes or failures that you can share? So how much time do we have right now? Uh, we have for failures, as much as you want. <laughs> I could fill up the entire time. I can, I can fill up the entire rest of this thing with all the mistakes I've made. Yeah, it's well, like people it's, love it's all the endless, stories. endless mistakes. Yeah. Um, I made a couple though that, that, you know how you like that cringe when you remember something you did that was really wrong? And it's funny because they're not the things that really it were the biggest things at all, but for some reason you just cringe at it. I once I once sent an email that I thought was sending to one person and it was about a takeover, an acquisition. Oh my god. And it was to somebody else. And it was I'm like, God, this is not public information. Oh god, oh god. Luckily I knew who the person was. <laughs> I go, oh, please, 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 just delete that. You didn't see it. You didn't see it. He says, don't worry. It's all okay. Oh, my God. Thank God. That was, that was horrible. Then I go all the way back. Beginning, remember, I, I started off as an IT guy. And starting off, the first job you had, you're operating, uh, you're an operator and, uh, running these mainframes. You're in the uh, control area running these mainframes. And, um, and this is July 4th night. And we're on a skeleton staff. Because nothing's happening, you know, next, you know, July 4th is a holiday in the market, so all that stuff, but I'm there. And I'm supposed to do some stuff, and the guy who's a program type guy, he, he asked me to do something, and he says he's on the phone. And I do it, but I hit the wrong thing. I did the wrong thing. And all of a sudden, I see all, all the different uh, monitors start turning red, or turning down, or winding down. And you can almost hear all the tapes, all the tape drives winding down, like, Oh God. And he's like, what, what happened? I said, nothing good. <laughs> and he had a bring in, oh, that's a disaster. It was horrible. I think enough with the failures. That's, that's just, I'm that's cringing. Not I'm thinking about it. That's not too So I was talking to the CEO of uh, Ronstad um, and he once told me he made a mistake that cost the company $150 million. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's pretty Yeah, cool. a bunch more just came to mind. I'm not going to tell you about those. Oh, that's not fun. <laughs> but they were costly. Yeah. They were costly. I mean, 150 million. Well, can you, what, can you talk in generalities without giving... Uh... Uh, mistakes made on trading floors. Let's leave it uh, okay. So this is back in the day when you were a trader. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, so how do you approach mistakes? Because I feel like a lot of people are very scared to make mistakes. Um when you made them and when you continue to make mistakes, how do you view them afterwards? Well, let's say when you first realize you've made it, if nobody else has noticed it, and this is what I, 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 I've always done is immediately let people know so you can stop the bleeding, whatever that mistake was. Hmm. Trying to make mistakes is permitted. Hiding them is not. Ah. That's the way I view it. I'm never going to hurt somebody. I'm not going to punish somebody for making a mistake. But if you hide it from me, I'm not going to treat you nicely. Yeah. Because I want people to know you're allowed to make mistakes. You're allowed. It's okay. Every human, we all make mistakes. I guess I can go through a lot. But don't hide them. Don't have, like, I don't need something like three years later comes up that this somebody did this thing and nobody knew. And now it's a disaster yeah. that we could have fixed it three years earlier. So mistakes are okay, but don't hide them. I, I like that a lot. Uh, getting back to something that you said earlier, um, you know, I, I am who I am. What's your philosophy on this idea of, you know, bringing your whole self to work? Uh, because there, there's been kind of this debate. Do you bring your whole self to work or your best self to work? Because your whole self, you know, 
people are a little bit quirky and interesting in some ways and, and maybe maybe they share too much of themselves. Maybe they're too vulnerable and they don't have any boundaries uh, between work and life. So how do you how do you deal with that? Because that's an increasingly difficult thing for people to figure out. I don't even know what it really means actually. Whole self. What's the other one? Whole self? And what was the other? Whole self and then uh, the other one was your best self. So whole best self. self. Whole self. Yeah. Whole, yeah. There's been, yeah, there's this debate on like <laughs> it's just I don't know. I don't know. Look, we all have we all we all have different ways to present yourself in different circumstances. I there's no doubt when I am with my friends from law school, I will act differently than when I am in the boardroom. And that's okay. Yeah. When you're at the baseball game, act differently than when you are at the tennis match. The tennis match, they really don't want you cheering a lot in the middle, in the middle of the point. You know, it's, it's kind of like, it's, don't do that. At the baseball game, you can be shouting and screaming at the guy, or, or let's say basketball, the guy's taking a foul shot. Yeah. You can do anything you want to try and disrupt them. So I think this idea, well, always, you know, do whatever you are. No, that's ridiculous. Yeah. There's societal norms to follow. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I like the societal um, norms. I remember when we talked a little while ago, um, one of the things that you told me is that uh, you can't be the leader of a world-sized organization unless you have a world-sized mindset. Can you talk a little bit about what having a world-sized mindset means and how do you go about actually developing that? Yeah. And, and I mean, because our world obviously it's become much smaller, essentially. I mean, it's not really physically smaller, but the connections are much more so. And time is a time to trunk, but your ability to communicate much more. And if you're in a world uh, class uh, business, world size business, you got a world uh, uh, attitude because you're dealing with other parts of the world that have different cultures, yeah. different beliefs, different standards. And you really have to, under, first you have to know about them and then you have to understand the differences and then you have to be able then to translate that. What does that mean for you and your organization? So when we found classic failures, if a, um, and let's go with the, it's almost, it's a cliche, but the best way to ruin a foreign company is to parachute in a bunch of American executives. Um, it's a cliche, but it's true because you put in somebody who knows nothing about the culture, about how things are, it's just going to be a disaster. So you have to try and at least recognize you know, you have your beliefs that you came before you came wrong, but you've got to start accepting and understanding what it is in other places. And otherwise, you'll, you will yeah. you absolutely will not work. Any suggestions on how to actually do that? Is it about just meeting with different people, grabbing coffee with different people? Like, how, how do you actually work on developing that? Start early education. Start early. A little bit of history of the world. Start early uh, cultural differences. Travel a tremendous yeah. amount. Yeah find friends, meet people from different cultures, continue to follow the news in other places. You know, it's funny, you know, you go, to, you read, um, if you don't, you don't have to know a foreign language, though helpful, but um, even reading uh, the English uh, uh, translations or the English uh, newspapers in a foreign country, uh, there are, are foreign news, with a different perspective on, on, on your own country if you're an American. They view it differently than, than you view it. And it's good to start trying to understand that a little bit. Yeah, I remember my grandfather, uh, he used to watch news programs in different uh, different languages. And I'd be like, what What the hell are you doing? Uh, and he's like, oh, I'm getting different perspectives. I want to hear how people in different parts of the world talk about where I live. And he was in Australia at the time. Uh, and I, I couldn't understand why he was doing it. And, uh, you know, now, now it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely helpful. And I, 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 I tell you, it's... Don't just listen to the American uh, news item. Go uh, BBC. Hey, it's English. You can understand it. It's fine. You're American. Just at least that alone will make a difference. And certainly, you can do that. By the way, within countries that uh, that they have different perspectives. Uh, in the U.S., obviously, CNN has a very different viewpoint than, say, Fox. Yep. Just looking at one, only looking at one, and ending up in an echo chamber, not good for developing a broad view of the people in America. Yep. If you're a foreigner coming to, I want to learn about America, I'm going to work in America. And let's say you're whatever, pick pick whatever, whatever. Say, I would tell you that person, look, when you come here, you got to be watching numerous different news shows. Don't watch just one because they'll view it very differently. Yep, totally agree. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left, so maybe one or two uh, more questions for you. Um, one of them 
just kind of broadly speaking for leaders out there who want to become more successful in their career, they, they, you know, they want to be more effective. Any advice or suggestions or tips uh, on, on what they should be doing or thinking about? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Here's the number one secret I'm going to give you. Okay. And uh, I'm giving away for free. Be lucky. Interesting. Because that's how my life has been. And I recognize that. And when I say lucky, I'm talking about chance. It's things that, yeah, I worked my, I worked really, really, really hard. And I, I really have spent a lot of my effort into my career and all that. But you know, something that had very little to deal with who, you know, my, I am who I am because my parents met and how they met was accidental. Mm-hmm. And the school that my parents chose what town to go to that the public schools that was really good. And the teachers I met that taught me there. And then for example, the course I took in school and college that I really excited me about something. And then later on that got into all this life is so much randomness. It's yeah. just randomness happening and you can't control it. So I guess telling the advice to be lucky is not really helpful because you can't control that. All you can do though, is try and increase the odds of something good happening. And that's working hard, getting an education, uh, doing, going that extra step for, for any, for, for your boss and, and trying to see what your boss wants. All the standard things we all know about how to get ahead. But the truth is, yes, that is necessary, but not sufficient for the success of CEO of a big company. For that, you need something that actually is very, very, um, let's just say it's not something you can buy. It's not something you can, you know, go get into the store. It's something that is just fortuitous. And too many people say, well, I built this all by myself. I, I created this. I built this giant company. Uh, no, you didn't. Yeah. Um, first, look around your company, all the people who work with you and all that, help that. And then all the people who's, uh, you know, use the cliche, whose shoulders you are standing on right now. Yep. And that's the real way to look at the at this. Somebody once told me it's uh, about creating your own luck, you know, kind of like a, a reserve basketball player who doesn't get the opportunity to play, but is always practicing the free throws, always working on their game. And then finally, one day, you know, another player gets injured and, you know, they get called in and it's lucky that they get called in. But while they're waiting for their opportunity, they're constantly working, they're studying, they're preparing, they're, they're waiting for that opportunity. Because I think eventually we all do get that opportunity. It's just a matter of are you going to grab it or are you just going to, you know, kind of wait, wait for it? I, I totally, it's absolutely perfectly said the way you said that, though. I, I wouldn't mind making one little change because yes. you said everybody gets that chance. Yeah. And I'd like to point out, actually, of the many billions who, who live on this earth, uh, what are we at? Seven point something, almost eight billion now, about eight billion. Yep. Unfortunately, most of them do not get yeah. that chance. Yeah, so, that's probably more accurate. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess it's being aware of... Um, identifying the opportunity if it does come your way and making sure that if it does come your way, you do. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's what is it? Opportunity knocks open the door. Yep. Yep. I love that quote. Uh, And maybe last question for you before we wrap up is uh, what keeps you up at night? Uh, What bothers you? What scares you? What, what freaks you out and how do you deal with it? So really actually, um, nothing recently has kept me awake, scared to the bejesus and like can't go to sleep. The thing that would, when it comes, hopefully it won't, but when it comes, will be illness, will be severe illness that something happens. You you walk into a doctor's office and they tell you something bad news about something they see or something. That'd be a that'd be a bad day, and I wouldn't sleep so well after that one. Um, there's the uh, obviously if something were to hear about your family, your children, things like that. That is business, not so much. You know, look, we've been through a heck of a lot. What's the very, very, very worst that could happen in our travel business that we're in? The very worst. What? We fail? Company goes bankrupt? What's the worst that could happen? Tell me the worst, okay? In the scheme of bad things that happen to people, that does not sound that horrible compared to so many horrific things that are happening all the time. I go to sleep absolutely perfectly fine. Pandemic? Yeah. We'll do our best to get out of it successfully. We'll try and preserve the common. We'll try and do well. We'll try and do well for all our stakeholders. And please, I hope it does. You know, it's bad. It's not as bad as people who are in a hospital uh, yeah. struggling for their to breathe because they have the pandemic. 
Yeah. Everything in perspective. Keeping keeping things in perspective and having that context is important. And I, I mean, sometimes I struggle with this too, right? I mean, you have like a frustrating day, like I'm trying to work on a new book and I'm just like, damn it, you know, this is so hard and frustrating. And sometimes I got to remind myself, like, really? Like your kids are healthy. You, you know, you can put food on the table and you're worried about like typing up some, some words in a, in a Google doc. Like, you know, I, I have Russian immigrant parents and the stories that they tell me about what they had to overcome you know, if I complain to them, like, ah, oh, dad, I'm having a hard time writing a book. He's going to say, what, what, the, what the bleep are you talking about here? Do you know what I had to do to get to this country? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously every generation says that, by the way, yeah. don't forget. I know, I know my grandparents probably went to school in 15 foot snow drifts with no shoes and uphill both ways. Um, but there is, there is some element of truth to what you're yeah. saying. And, and I would definitely say that one of the things I have been trying to do for a very, very long time is separate out um, the, the emotion I'm feeling, why I'm feeling it, and trying to distance myself from it. Because when you look at it from the outside, say, you know, that's not worth the energy. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I no, couldn't agree more. Uh, well, I think that's a fantastic way to wrap up. Uh, Glenn, where can people go to learn more about you, your company, anything that you want to mention for people to check out? Well, they want to learn about the company. It's Booking Holdings, but the brands are Booking.com, Priceline, Kayak, Open Table, and then Agoda is based in Asia. Uh, rental cars, you want to do that for a, for a, to rent a car? Um, those are also great brands, great ways to uh, travel. You know, I, 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 we think our service is fantastic, and I won't go through the pitch of why, but check it out. If you want to learn about me, I'd ask. Why? Again, let's go back to time management, discipline on your time. I think there are probably better ways to spend the time. Yeah, I love it. Uh, well, Glenn, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to share insights with me. I, I certainly learned a lot. I hope people learned a lot as well. So thank you again. And thanks everyone for tuning in. My guest again has been Glenn Fogel, the president and CEO of Booking Holdings. And I will see all of you next week. Thanks again for tuning in to today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. I cannot express how important those reviews and ratings are to the success of this show, and they keep allowing me to bring back amazing guests. Lastly, don't forget to check out the brand new PDF that I just put out, which looks at the evolution of the employee. In other words, how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization should do to adapt. You'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like, as well as action items that you can and should be taking. That PDF is available at thefutureemployee.com. And if you want to reach out to me for whatever reason, whether it's inviting me to speak, sponsoring the show, or just giving me some feedback, you can always do so. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Again, that's jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you next time.